But looking at then how the digital ties into what we have, I'm going to focus on biology, but I want you to know biology, physics, earth science, chemistry, physical science, all of the high school courses follow the same structure. And so what I show you in biology is going to work exactly the same way in those other courses. It was just easier to pick one and focus on that particular one. So when we go into the program, the first thing you should let me back up here. First thing I want you to remember at the high school level is the structure and that every that we divided it into units. Those units contain three, four, five modules. If you want to think of a module as a chapter, you can think of it like that, just a different term for it. And then inside of that module are three, four, five lessons. And the number of modules in the unit, the number of lessons in the module all depend on the standards that are being covered and how deep we need to go into those standards. So I want you to realize that structure. When we finish, when we get into the lessons, we're going to use that 5e lesson model, engage, explore, and explain, evaluate, and elaborate, or elaborate and evaluate. You can see it goes in a circle. And then when we come to the end of the lessons in the module, let's say there are five lessons, we come to the end of lesson five, we're going to come back and we're going to reflect and do some review on that module level and the things that we started out at the beginning of the module. When we come to the end of the modules, you have an opportunity to do some reflection on that opening unit. So when we go into this, I'm actually going into a standard on genetics. And one of the things that you'll see at the unit level, and remember we talk unit, we're talking big picture. So when we think about genetics and biology, that's a huge idea. And we're going to break that down into multiple modules or multiple chapters that really go into identify this. But we have built some things in at the unit level. And the purpose of these is twofold. One, it's to get student engagement and student discourse started around the topic that we're getting to do, we're starting to do. And then it's to include a couple of things that really look for mastery of the standards. So I want to highlight a few of these pieces for you really quickly. And I'm going to suggest some things. You don't have to do these, of course. We know as a teacher, this program is a resource for you. But I'm going to suggest some things that you think about. Now, storylines are part of the NGSS, along with phenomenon and those kinds of things. But when we talk about storylines, at the beginning of every unit in the high school courses, you're going to see the storyline. And the storyline ties into the overarching phenomenon question. So the overarching phenomenon question in this unit is why are there numerous breeds of domestic dogs? Now, I've been in some countries in the world. I was in the Gambia and Africa, and it seemed like every dog we, dog we saw looked exactly the same. Um, I know in most places it's not like that. And if you just look at the picture on the screen, really that question is about raising student interest. And when we raise that question, all the storylines are, is how are the modules in this unit tied to that topic? So if you see, this, this unit has three modules, in Introduction to Genetics, Patterns and Inheritance, Molecular Genetics, and Biotechnology. And so how do these things tie back to this original question? What will students be learning when, <laughs> when they're inside of these? So we start out with that anchor phenomenon. Why are there different breeds of dogs domestically? We introduce the storylines and just highlighting for you how these tie together. And then we do a couple other things. Now, I'm going to flip over to the digital for a minute. And I want to click into the teacher's edition. Now, if you're online in the TE, a couple things that are nice to know. One, I was actually on my dashboard and I clicked on the teacher edition. And when I did that, like this, it always opens in a screen that's shrunken. But there's a little arrow here that says open in a new tab. And that's what I did. So I could have my other resources open, but I could have my teacher edition open at the same time. So a couple of things I want to highlight for you. When we open with that phenomenon, in your teacher edition, you're going to see this initial spread that says student-led learning. And another thing when you're in the teacher edition, I don't know about you looking at your screen. It's very difficult for me to read this on my screen. So there are two things that I like to do. Number one, on your computer, 
I'm on a PC or a Dell, I can actually hit my F11 key and I can get rid of that URL bar at the top. And the only reason I say that, it gives me a lot more space on my screen to see this. On a Mac, it's command something. I can never remember what it is because I don't use Mac very often. But if you Google it on your computer, you can do the same thing. You maximize the screen. But the other thing I want you to know, when you're in the teacher or student edition online, you'll have this little button on the right-hand side that says single page or double page view. And if I go to single page, I can see this so much better. Now, three things that we do here that I would encourage you use. Now, you don't have to use these, but I would strongly encourage it because the beginning of the unit is to engage students in the idea. So what can I do here? Number one, it's going to say under student-led learning, there's a science probe. And in this probe, based off of Paige Keeley's work, it says how are chromosomes, DNA, and genes related to each other. So use this probe to tie into that idea. Now, if you haven't used the probes before, we've done sessions on this. It always starts out with a scenario. It always has student choice. And it always has students explain the reasoning behind that choice. Now, if we wanted to see this one, because it's not in the book, where would I find it? So I would go back right here to my dashboard, and I'm going to click on Table of Contents, and I'm in human th Unit 3 on Genetics. And so if I click into my Unit 3, I'm going to see my Planning and Presentation Resources. I'm going to open it up. There's my PowerPoint for the unit. There's the Answer Key for the probe. These are my Teacher Resources. And if I go to Learning Resources, here's the student materials for this. So here's my probe. I'm going to open this one up. It's just a printable. But notice this. How are chromosomes, DNA, and genes related to each other? As I scroll down the page, genetics is a study of how an organism can code the information, da 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 Okay. Put an X next to all the statements that best describe the relationship between chromosomes, DNA, and genes. And then explain your thinking. The best way to use this is to use it in class, either up on a screen projected, I mean, I could project this right from here or having the students have it and then do a think pair share. Have them do it, reflect on their reasoning, have them turn to a partner and share that, and then have that become a whole group discussion. The point of this is twofold. One is engagement, allowing students to have an entry point in that lesson and verbally express themselves. The second one is to identify misconceptions that students already have. Chromosomes, DNA, and genes in high school biology should not be new topics, but for many of our students, they will not have the recall they need and will be confused about how those tie together. So one of the things is that probe. There are two other strategies that we introduce, though. I'm going to go to the next page. One of these is called the driving question board. This isn't... Um, you're not going to find it in the digital. You're not. It's a strategy. It's not in the book. And really what this is, why are there numerous breeds of domestic dogs? That's our anchor phenomenon question. And then allowing students to say, what kind of questions do you have? And notice these are on sticky notes. Okay. Does one breed more, you know, overwhelm another one? Is one color stronger than, I mean, there's a lot of questions that they could start coming up with. And then as we go through the, the, um, the module and the lessons, we're able to look at topics that start answering these questions. But I tell you this, the instruction is much more pertinent to the student if there actually goes to questions that they ask. Now, do I have to focus on those questions? No, most of those questions are going to tie in, but I should be aware of them. So when we hit a topic that directly relates to some of the questions, we can answer that and think about having those questions up and then being able to write the answers on them while you're while you're studying through this unit really would make a difference for students. Now, you could do this actually with physical sticky notes in your class or there's a um, free digital tool out there called Lino, L-I-N-O. That is a virtual sticky board or you could use a Padlet to do it. Put those notes up there and then answer them as you come up with the answers. So the driving question board is one strategy we use. It ties the topics in the unit together. And then the other one we talk about is a summary table. The summary table is simply, what are the kinds of things that we found as we've gone through here? 
What kind of evidence would we find to answer the questions that we had? Or it could be the general question, why are there different breeds of domestic dogs? What am I finding as I go through the different material that we're working on? So these are three strategies, the probe, the driving question board, and the summary table that we could use at the beginning of the unit to create that understanding or that engagement. The other one I want to mention right here is that every unit in the high school program and then every module in K-8 has a STEM unit project. And the way we built these is to be a performance task. So in this one, we are actually, and you know, this makes sense, we're in a unit on genetics. We're going to look at genetically engineered corn. So students are going to research and vary, identify various methods of controlling a specific corn worm and the steps used in creating a specific bacteria or specific type of corn, I'm sorry. Um, they're going to look at that and look at how it applies to this. Notice at the bottom how many different performance expectations are tied in to this project. So I actually have four different life science or biology performance expectations, and I have two engineering expectations. Now, this is coming right out of the student book, what you're seeing right here. If I come back over to that teacher edition and I go over just a little bit in that, I'm going to see my storylines here. We were looking at a minute ago, and in fact, so we can see it a little bit bigger. Let me go back to the two-page view. This is where it's going to introduce that STEM project for us. That's where I pulled that picture out of it. And it tells you online, you have some resources to go along with that. Where would I find those resources? Well, it's at the unit level, so I would be at unit three. And if I scroll down a little bit, here's my STEM unit project planner. Here's the project itself. The rubric, the student facing rubric is right here. And then I'm gonna scroll back up. Here's the rubric guide for the teacher under the teacher resources. You may not do this every unit, but I'm gonna tell you what, this is the true performance task to see if students understand what they're doing. It will say at the module level, let's do a little bit of planning about our unit project. And then at the end of the unit is when you really bring this to fruition. Now at that unit level, you'll have some other resources you're gonna see down here. There's a Smithsonian piece that ties into this. It's an actual article that came out of the Smithsonian Institute, typically has an extension activity, but those are the materials at that big, broad unit level that we were looking at. Now, the unit then leads to a module. This module is module 11, or if you wanna think of it as chapter, chapter 11, on molecular genetics. Let me reach over here for a second. I wanna make sure I'm watching my time, okay? This one is on um, molecular genetics. So you're gonna see at this level, we have what we call an investigative phenomenon. Why do the rungs of the DNA ladder appear broken? And if you look at that image, notice how they're not connected, okay? Now, in this then, what are the things that we're gonna build out for students with this? Well, first of all, we're gonna look at those performance expectations that tie directly to this topic. This is gonna be right in your teacher edition, okay? We're also gonna highlight the module storylines. So think about it at the unit level, we looked at how the different chapters connect to our phenomenon question. Here, we're going to look at how the lessons tie. Why do the rungs of DNA ladder appear broken? Um, by the way, it's great visual on that page, really thinking about what DNA actually looks like. Um, but it's going to then go in genetic material, replication, DNA, RNA, and protein, and gene regulation, mutation. All those tie back to the DNA into actual um, replication of DNA and then the translation process that goes on. So when you think about the storylines, it's something that we build in. And then in the module planner in the teacher edition, you're going to see different resources that can be used both at the module level and at the lesson level to tie back to this idea. So while you're planning, and that was one of the points at the module level, I'm able to look at all the opportunities to investigate what we might be doing. Now, I'm going to click back over to the digital for a minute. And I'm going to go to that teacher edition. And I want to go to 
module 11. So if I scroll down a little bit, there's module 10, here's module 11. So I'm gonna click over to encounter the phenomenon. And if I flip to the next page, oh, you go back a page, okay? There's that planner. So here's my performance expectations. And then as I go into the planner, you can see why single page is so much better. I can look and say, here are all the opportunities I have to investigate. So it's gonna talk about the claim evidence reasoning strategy. Here are the different resources I can use. Notice in this one, um, under um, I've got a couple different FET simulations that I can use. And then down at the bottom, we have a piece called applying practices that we'll look at in a little more detail as we work our way through this, okay? But this should give you an overview of things that I can do during this time to start the module in the lessons and then to wrap the module up, okay? So I have a, a variety of opportunities to investigate that material, but all of that's in my teacher edition, kind of highlighting it for me. Again, whether I'm digital or whether I'm in print looking at that material. Let's go back and take a look and go forward. So these are some of the things that you're gonna have available to you to again, engage students in that topic and really to create an opportunity for what they do in the lessons to have meaning. Now, what do I mean by that? First thing we have is our investigative phenomena. Almost always, both at the unit level and at the module level, there is going to be a video that goes along with that phenomenon. And again, it's all about introducing students to the topic, engaging them. Then I wanna mention two last things. The claim evidence reasoning strategy is students make a claim about the phenomenon at the module level while they work their way through the lessons, while they do the labs, if they do a, as they do their reading, if they're engaged in a thought experiment, whatever they do, they're looking for evidence to either support or refute their claim. So we really wanna highlight that because it gives a reason for them to be looking for something while they're doing those lessons, while they're doing the lab. Because I'm going to tell you from my experience, I've taught for a long time. From my experience, most students, when they're involved in an activity, whether it's a lab, whether it's an analysis, whether it's a data piece, their primary goal is to get it done. They aren't necessarily looking for any kind of connection to any larger framework of science. The claim evidence reasoning strategy gives them a reason to look for something that has meaning to the bigger context. And then it's also gonna mention the optional launch lab. For every module, there's a quick lab that's a great way to get them involved in the idea that we're looking at. Now I'm gonna stop just for a second. I'm going to say, well, where do I find these things? Okay. Where is this phenomenon video? Where's the claim evidence reasoning? So if we go back to the digital, and by the way, I know I'm flipping back and forth. The reason I'm doing that is it's one thing to tell you about resources. It's another thing for you to find them and know where to use them. So in my TE, it's going to tell me about all these things. Well, where do I find them though? So I'm going to go back to my digital. And it doesn't matter if I'm in this page or if I went back to the dashboard. The whole idea is this table of contents right here. So we click this open. We were at unit three. I want to go to module 11. So right next to it is this arrow. If I click on the arrow, it's going to show me the three modules that are in this unit. And then if I want to go to the lessons, I would click the arrow here, it would show me the lessons. But we're going to go right now to the module level. And it's going to think about it just for a minute. And when I scroll down, you're going to see my module planning and presentation resources. So that's always teacher facing. If I open this up, I can click into my teacher edition at the module level. That'll actually open up the same TE I have and it'll open up to the module opening page. If you scroll down a little bit, you're going to have an answer key to the science notebook and reading essentials. And I just want to highlight this one for a minute. 
we actually went back and created teacher PowerPoints at the unit level and the module level. They are real PowerPoint. You can click on that and use it. Let me give you a warning, please, though. Don't take this and just stand in front of class and talk. Um, the PowerPoint is to help guide discussion, but it's not meant to replace hands-on labs or the students working in investigations or in applying practices pieces. So just know it's there, download it, use it, but don't make it your whole course. <coughs> Learning resources are student facing. So if I click this open, here's a link directly to my student edition. There's a Spanish version if that would be helpful to a student. There's my science notebook, my reading essentials. We'll talk about these pieces. Okay. And here's my smart book. And we'll talk about that as well. But here are the ones that I really want to take a look at. In that module opener, you're going to see a piece that says encounter the phenomenon. And right underneath it is the digital version of my claim evidence reasoning. Really quick, let's take a look at these two. I'm going to click on encounter the phenomenon. Notice what I didn't see. I didn't see the video. And that's because the video's built into this piece. So right here, the discovery of genetic material known as um, DNA has led to a dramatic change in the field of biology. Why do the runs appear broken? Let's learn about the discovery of DNA. And you're going to notice that video is built right in. And I didn't share with sound, so you're not going to hear it. But it's a piece that actually goes into the discovery of DNA and how that happened. Um, but it's built right into that encounter piece to benefit our students. Now, let me shrink this back down. I'm going to close that. Right after it is my claim evidence reasoning. I can click this open. The students can actually, we have a printable version in your program resources. But right here, record your claim. And then as they start to go through, what evidence are you finding? Do I need to revise that claim? By the way, the longest page on this should be this page because they can come back to this and keep filling it in. And then when I go ahead, I what was my reasoning when I come down to the end? Why do I think my claim is valid based off the evidence? And why does that show me that my claim is true? But that claim evidence reasoning piece is built in here. Couple other things at the module level. There is a pretest, you know, what kind of knowledge they already have that they should have. Here's my launch lab with the answer key. And then you're going to see your other resources. My module wrap up, that's when I come to the end of the module. My assessments are in here. And then in the module library, if you just want the separate video, it's down here. And then we have some connections to careers that tie directly to this and a couple extension activities. Whenever you see real world biology or real world chem, it is kind of a lab opportunity that's really focused around things happening in the world. So they really tie nicely into what you're doing. So at the module level, you have all of those resources to support the investigation of that larger topic. You also know you have the assessment pieces that go along with it. Now let's go into a lesson because <clears throat> this is what we do every day. Now, one thing you really need to know a lesson does not mean one day. A lesson is not necessarily one period. You'll actually see the pacing in that planning guide. And if we go back over here and click back over to our module level, um, it gives me an idea. And let's go to the single page view. It gives me an idea of how much time approximately do we think that these lessons should take. So the module at the beginning with the encounter of the phenomenon, making their claim, if we do the launch lab, that should be about 45 minutes. But lesson one, that's about a 90 minutes. So if you're in a block, you may do it in one block. If you're in a regular class, it may take you a couple days, depending on what you do with the labs. There's a bio lab in this lesson and a quick investigation. It may take you a little bit longer than that okay, to work, to work through that. Now, I'm gonna flip back over Let's think about the things that I'm going to find in a lesson. Okay? So we highlight a couple of things. Every lesson is going to start with a focus question. It's not a phenomenon. The phenomenon is at the module level. But how is DNA, I'm in lesson three, how is DNA and RNA involved in transcription and translation? So we're going to go into the central dogma and what happens. Notice down at the bottom of the page, though, and this is in the student book. 
let's collect some evidence and let's investigate by going online. And it actually calls out one of our specific pieces called applying practices. So I start out with providing a little bit of information about what transcription and translation are, about the different types of RNA, and then I introduce this. And in that online, there are a couple different options here, and you're actually gonna see this. See the piece that says implementation option? It actually says you could do this two different ways. You could do more of a teacher facilitated approach Use your teacher presentation, make sure you're creating discourse, make sure you're still doing some of the hands-on, or you could create a student-led pathway by using some of the different interactive content along with their student edition. Now, I need to look through then the resources to decide what pieces of this I'm going to use in either my teacher-facilitated approach, that's more with you guiding it, still creating input, or if I'm going to have more student-led where they're doing more of the investigation, we're coming back together to kind of connect the science they're working on to the larger context of what we're trying to accomplish. A couple of tools it shows you here. Here's the lesson presentation. And here's the interactive content. So let me take a look right here. Yep. So think about this from a teacher perspective and a student perspective. So I'm at the beginning of this lesson. And what I want to do is launch the lesson using either the PowerPoint presentation or the interactive content to spark discussion and add some questions to our driving question board. That's why I recommend starting that out at the unit level. What is the student doing? So, I mean, here's my PowerPoint. There's the interactive content. Now, let me, before I go on, what's the student doing? Let me flip back over here to the online. Now, because I'm saying interactive content, we're going to go into a lesson then. We're in module 11. And if I click the arrow, let's go to lesson three. <coughs> and in lesson three, I'm going to go down. Just remember, planning and presentation is more orientated towards you. I click this open, you can answer keys from my science notebook and reading essential. But here's that teacher PowerPoint. Okay. Now, this is straight PowerPoint. When you click this, it's going to have you download it. It's white slide, so you can change the background. And what do I mean about changing the background? All of you that use PowerPoint, that's what I did with this one. These slides were part of that presentation from this lesson. I downloaded them and just used a new theme and made them look a little bit nicer, but it started out with the focus question, okay? And then brought up the central dogma and has the images that are connected right here that come out of the material. But that piece is available for you to prompt discussion. Now let's talk a little bit then about interactive content. So I've got my learning resources. That's gonna take me to my student book. And then underneath it is where I go into my five E's. I'm going to engage. So notice here, I've got to launch the lesson piece on DNA, RNA, and protein. Two things I can do with it. Number one, I could just open it and let the students use it, or I can open it and use it myself. I want you to notice this is three slides. And again, I can either go full screen or I can open in a new tab. I'm going to open this one in a new tab because I want to be able to get back here and get to some other things. But when we open this, you would never know the video is there, but this is watching how cells use DNA to code, to, uh, to code for proteins. And I can click that. I can go whole screen with it. I've got closed captioning with it. These are chunked pieces of content that tie directly into what's in the student edition. But notice here then, I can go to my next page. So let's think about it. And remember, I'm just introducing the topic. What do I know? What do I want to know? Tied to that focus question. And then when I go into the last one, here's some vocabulary. And that's why this piece is called Launch the Lesson. This is in the Engage piece. If I scroll down a little bit more, we've combined Explore and Explain. And if I click Explore and Explain Open, there is more of that interactive content. 
So let's look at the central dogma. We've got a couple different pieces that tie into that. Underneath, let's look at one gene, one enzyme. And then I've got some applying practices pieces, a FET simulation. These are all pieces that can be used. But if we click open the interactive content, like this explore and explain, and I'm just going to go whole screen. By the way, it saves it wherever the student was. Notice here's the central dogma. I've got a little bit of content. I've got some imagery. This is the same imagery that's in the text. As I move ahead in this, I can look at the different types of RNA. And as I scroll down, the reason we call it interactive content is because I'm able to do things with it. So let's say I just want to look at one of these. I can click over, look at the description, or I want to see all of them. Okay. So I can highlight, click one, take a look at it, go to some of the other ones. And then when I get to screen three, there's actually a built-in check here that provides data to you. So notice only two questions. But if you assign this to the students, they can actually answer these questions and you can see how they did on them. If you don't assign it, they can still see the content, but they when they get to the check, it'll just say your teacher hasn't assigned this to you. Let's scroll down a little bit more. Let me click into the next one. In this, you're just going to find the students can interact with it in different ways. And notice, this one is seven pages long. So let's remember what that initial dogma is. And then here, select the circles and watch the animation to learn more about transcription. Now, what does it mean by select the circles? If I scroll down a little bit, you're going to see there are five circles right here. Right here, I'm going to start with the first one, RNA polymerase. What does that do? And again, there's some audio that goes along with this. But I just want you to think about this. How much more impactful is this for a student than just to read the book? So these interactive content pieces are built into every lesson and they're chunking pieces from that lesson in the book into bite-sized pieces with some interactivity tied into these. Now we say interactive content. I can use that interactive content whether I'm working with um, I'm leaving, <coughs> doing more teacher facilitated, or if the students are actually working through this content themselves. Now, how would a student work through the content? How would they get a hold of this? One, it's on their lesson page. If they went to unit three, module 11, lesson three, if I scroll down back to my interactive content, it says visible to students, that's on their lesson page. I scroll down a little bit more. These explore and explains are on their lesson page. Now I could decide I want to show it in class. I don't want it on their page. I can click my buttons and say, hide that. That's no longer on their page, but I can also show it to them. I could assign it. If I assign it, they're going to do the little quiz. Now, not every piece has the quiz, but I could assign it and they could do the quiz. But I'm going to tell you the most effective way to make these available to the students are to make sure they're in the presentation. Now, this is not the PowerPoint right here. You have a present button and right next to it, you have an edit button. And you can go in and if you click the edit button, you can see every resource in this lesson. Here's my ebook, my science notebook. Here are my interactive content pieces. I've got all of those live. If I don't want it, I just click the button that hides it. When I click on it again, it brings it up. Okay. I could look if I'm going to do the applying practices piece. I'll highlight that in a minute. I can add that. That's now in here. Or maybe I'm not. Or if I'm going to do the FET simulation, I can put this in here. Now that, and you know what? Let's leave the FET for a minute. Let me close out of this. And if I go to present now, it's going to bring up only the pieces that I put in here. And your students have access to this if they have the digital license. They can open that presentation right from their lesson page, and then they could look at each resource that's been built into this material or in the presentation for them. So it's a great tool 
whether you're facilitating the lesson or whether it's more student led by them working their way through these resources and then us summarizing. So just two different approaches to do the same thing, looking at that. So you either launch the lesson using that interactive content piece or you use the PowerPoint to bring it up and do more of a guided discussion around that. Now, as we go in, I'm going to set the context for protein synthesis. Again, doing the same kind of thing, either using the PowerPoint or that interactive content. And what do I want students doing? I want them either using a science journal, it's just a notebook that you're journaling with, or their science notebook that we've created to synthesize these ideas. Now, the science notebook is a support piece that goes along with this. I really like it. It's a Cornell note-taking piece, main idea, detail, summary. And then in that, students can respond to that. So if I click over here, under my planning resources, I'm going to see the answer key. And then under my learning resources, if I scroll down just a little bit, it may be, uh, here we go, under learning resources right here. Okay, there's my science notebook. This can be printed or it's a fillable PDF. Wherever there's a line, you can type into it. Here's the vocabulary that we're working with. And now let's start looking, compare and contrast RNA and DNA in the Venn diagram. Okay, and as they go down through this, <clears throat> choosing the different areas of Bloom's taxonomy to have students synthesize the information. Now, this is not you lecture and they fill this in. It's not a guided reading thing where they read and take it right out. They have to take the ideas and put them together. Okay. Could I tie this into what I'm doing in class if I'm using the PowerPoint? You sure could. Okay. Here's the function of everyone. They could do that. Now on their own, we talked about how the steps of transcription happen. You go ahead and do it yourself. Sequence this. And they have the ability to do that. <laughs> so it's a great tool to use while I'm working my way through that lesson. Now, the other thing I can do is start to look at it. After I set the context, we can synthesize those notes. We can take a look with some of the material in the interactive book. But then we're going to give them an opportunity to explore. And there are multiple ways to explore the science in this. One of these is called applying practices. Now, applying practices is what I like to call, call a thought experiment. So they're not doing a physical lab. They're actually using one of the science and engineering practices to investigate the idea that we're working with. So what they're going to do, many times they'll create a model, not a physical model, a thought model. They'll look at the background. So you'll notice here, I got a little bit of review. But then I have the application piece. And this is looking at how antibiotic drugs work by disrupting the synthesis of proteins of bacteria, or how many of them do. So in this, I've got an opportunity to take what we just looked at, use one of the science and engineering practices, and apply it directly to this lesson. So different ways the students could do this. The applying practices is one. There's a FET simulation in this one on gene expression that I could have my students use. And we even have the suggestions for using this. Now, by the way, that's a, many of you have used FET over the years. This is a huge piece that really gives you some support in looking at how to use this, okay? So I've got my applying practices, I have my FET simulation. So I've got them involved. I'm watching what they're doing when they work their way through it. This lesson, I happen to have a virtual lab that goes along with it as well, looking at mutation. And then, I can also use my labs to do this. So let's stop just a second. Okay. With this lesson, if I was planning, I'm going to introduce the topic and the central dogma. Okay. If it's an earth science lesson, if it's a chemistry lesson or a physics lesson or physical science, I'm going to look at that introduction of that lesson. I'm going to do that with my PowerPoint slides or I'm going to do it with the interactive content. Maybe I built it into the streaming presentation. Maybe I haven't. Number two, I'm going to let my students research a little bit. 
or I'm going to start to lay out what happens in transcription translation. Maybe I have the students do it in that interactive content. Now we're going to take some time in this lesson to actually go in and really investigate that science. There is no way that you can do all of these. You have to choose which you feel are most appropriate for your students and for your class. Now, when you look at the bio labs on how is DNA extracted, you might look and say, I don't have the equipment for that. So what about the DNA modeling DNA replication? Notice both of those are Word documents. It means you can alter it and change the resources that you have to do it. So I could look at hands-on. I could look at applying practices. I could use it to simulation or the virtual lab and think which of these is best for me to do in my class. I might end up doing two of them. We might do the simulation and then I may have the students do the applying practices for homework because it's a great application of the science and then bring it back. Now, again, I'm gonna stop just for a second and go over to the digital because where do I find all of this? So any resource that we just looked at, lab, applying practices, FET simulation, virtual lab, these are gonna be found typically in the blade, and let's collapse these, that says, explore and explain, because that's what we're doing. With these hands-on or virtual investigations, we're exploring and we're seeking to explain. So if I click that open, underneath my interactive content, notice, here's my applying practices, transcription, translation, and right underneath it, the answer key. We're always gonna do that for you. Here's my FET simulation. Here's my virtual investigation and my virtual investigation worksheet. What is that? If I wanna do the virtual investigation and I wanna do it small group or whole group, we could use the virtual investigation online, but the students could be completing this digitally. When I scroll down just a little bit more, there's the answer key. And then if I go into elaborate, I'm gonna see some of my elaborate material right here. Now I could also look in my lesson library and see what's available. And then there's my FET simulation with the teacher guide and that same virtual investigation that was available, just putting them in a different place. So the things directly in this lesson, I'm gonna find right here that I can then use my student with my students. Again, I could assign these. I could just say, I wanna make this visible to the students. I want it on their page. Or I could put it in my presentation that's now active in my presentation. Okay. Some of you that have been using this more than one year, um, I wanna just mention two things we've added that are new in the digital. One, when I alter that presentation, if I teach multiple sections of my course, I can click the little three buttons next to it and say, sync that presentation. And I can sync that customized one to all of my classes. So I can only have to change it once. <coughs> The other one I want you to see that we added is over here, right underneath where it says lesson three, it says assign. And when I click this open, it will show me everything in the lesson. So like right here, I could actually click and assign out all this interactive content at one time to my students. So I could choose everything I wanna use in this lesson that I want the students to have as an assignment, do it all at one time. Now I'm not gonna, do that. I'm actually going to go, I'm going to cancel that, but it, but it gives you some additional resources to be able to use. Okay. So I really want to get them involved in those hands-on activities that they're doing. The other thing you can be doing is when you go into your teacher's edition, there are a lot of strategies for you, both how to scaffold learning and how to extend the learning for students. So notice if I have students in my classes, which many of you do, that English is their second language, you're gonna see this visual literacy connection, how to use the images and the text or interactive content to really support understanding. This one comes with an activity and the reason that activity is there for students to visualize. You're gonna find the teacher toolbox. We know that these books were written in the US. What are some ways that I can tie into the actual culture and background of my students? You're gonna see a lot of demonstrations 
These are meant for you to be able to, again, highlight for students in front of the class when maybe you don't have time to do a whole lab investigation. And then I have my applying practices called out here. And we touched on these real world pieces we found at the unit level. Uh, I'm going to skip this one. When I get to the end of that lesson, I may want to check for understanding. And there is a built-in lesson check. It's printable or for this example right here, it's actually interactive. So I can assign that out. I'm going to see it at the lesson level, but then I'm also going to find it in my assessment. So if I went over back to the course, I'm still in my lesson. When we come down to evaluate and open this up, there's some resources they can study, but here's my lesson check. If I want to assign it as is, I can assign it right here. If I want to edit that, I can come up to my menu and go to my assessments. And when I go to my assessments, I could go to module 11, which is right here, open it up. I'm going to see my pretest. I'm going to see my lesson checks, my small checks. I'm going to see my lesson check for each of the lessons. And then I'll also see my summative assessment down here at the bottom. What's the difference? Only difference here is I can customize it. We're not going to do that today because I want to highlight just the last couple of things and get a couple of questions in, okay? But that lesson check, again, paper, pencil. And then if you haven't seen it in that assessment engine and printable, there's a piece called the 3D assessment guide. Now, I'm going to click back over one more time. When I go back to my folders, you're going to see... You scroll all the way down, go to the second page. You're going to see this piece that says three-dimensional assessment guide, earth and space, life, physical. Physical has both the physics and the chemistry in it and engineering. Now, the other place to find this, if you go back to your course and I want the printable version, I can go all the way back to my program resources. And you're going to see a blade that says 3D assessment guide. And you will see the printable version of that. You have your teacher version and you have your student version. So digital and printable. But it really is some great three-dimensional questions that are tied directly to the performance expectation. Okay. Now, I'm going to um, wrap this up really quick, hit a couple of questions. But I want I want to head up at the end of that module. <clears throat> that's where I come down to one of my special features. Could be ethics, could be science and society, could be a lot of different things. But then I come back, I revisit the phenomenon. I wrap up my claim evidence reasoning. I plan for my STEM project if I'm doing it. What did we do in this module that ties into what we're doing with the STEM project? And then finally, there's always an extension lab. And then when I wrap up the module or the unit, that's where I pull that STEM project in and come back and revisit. Now, four support pieces that are built in. I don't have time to go into them right now, but I do want you to be aware of them. One is that Reading Essentials and Science Notebook. The Reading Essentials exists for biology and physical science. That's a lower level reader of the text. It's found at the lesson level with the answer key. The Science Notebook is for all courses. That's that Cornell note-taking guide. ESL support, that's important for many of our students. You're going to see that in the teacher edition, but I do want you to be aware of this if you have not seen it. Um, I'm going to come back to my, um, I'm going to go back to the lesson we were in. Let me go to genetics. Let's go into module 11, lesson three. Under my learning resources, here's my student edition. And when I click this open, we get these same two tabs. I can open full screen right here, or I can open a new tab. If I open this in a new tab, and let me come over a page. Oh, we'll go here and do it. I can actually then, if I open it in a new tab, I can use this with my Google Translate extension. So we know it's not perfect. But I could go here and say, you know what? I need to change this to Arabic. And if I scroll down this page, you're going to notice 
And again, while it's not perfect, for some of our students, that might be a real help to be able to get the context in Arabic, and then I can go back to the original. So just know that support is there along with the suggestions in the teacher edition. SmartBook, if you're not using it, you really need to do that. We have training on SmartBook available. And then my 3D assessment guide we touched on. These are some things along with the differentiation suggestions in the teacher edition to support student learning. So I'm going to stop there for a minute because I'm almost at time. And there were a couple things that are in here. Um, Rana, the real thing about this was not so much the fact that I was doing it biology. Physics is laid out exactly the same way. Unit level, module level, lesson level. I would have those same choices that we looked at today. I was just using biology as the example. And then let me come over here. Oh, the wrap up, the wrap up of the module. Let me come back here for a minute. And I'm in the student edition this time. Let me come over here to <clears throat> module 11. And I'm going to scroll all the way down. When I come to the end of any module, it's going to have, again, let me shrink this a little bit. It's going to have my review. This will be in the student book as well. So it kind of highlights that. When I go to the next page, this is where I come to that module wrap up and really what it's doing. After we went through these four lessons, that was kind of around this idea. Let's come back to our phenomenon. Why do the rungs of the DNA ladder appear broken? What kind of discussion can I get from the group? If I use the claim evidence reasoning at the module level, which I strongly suggest, Let's look at, was my claim valid? Do I need to change my claim? What's my reasoning on it? If we're doing the STEM project, let's think about the project. What can I use from here to apply to my project? And then lastly, this is that extension activity. This is based on real data. Students can go in, how can a virus affect transcription? And students can actually look at that data. It works on... Um, it really works on the science and injured practice of collecting evidence, but it allows them to actually use the data to understand this topic and it's building that skill. But it takes what we've just done, again, takes it into a real world setting and um, applies that. Now, let me check here. Okay, you will get the recording and then let me see. Okay, I think that are the questions right now. I'm right at the hour, so I'm gonna stop there. If you have another question, feel free to drop it in the chat, but I hope this was somewhat helpful in looking how to use the choices. Main thing, guys, just I would say to you is this, you can't do everything in here. You have to make choices. Use that teacher edition to look and say, what's most beneficial for my students? But I would say the more you have them involved through the driving question board, through doing claim evidence reasoning, using the summary table, doing the applying practices people pieces, using the simulation and hands-on labs, using the interactive content, the more you can get the students in this, the more understanding will take place. So with that, Sherish, I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. That was a great session. There's one thing that I see in the chat box um do we always yeah, you, need digital? yeah <laughs> yeah you do need a digital license that goes along with the book to play the videos yes you do thank you have a wonderful evening thank you so much dj for your time i appreciate it as always you're welcome sherish thank you everyone appreciate you bye